Okay, so here we go. So last week, if you're with us, we saw Jesus step forward with resolve and power in the Garden of Gethsemane when his disciple, if you remember, Judas, came to betray him with a combined force of Roman soldiers and Jewish officials when they came to arrest him. Jesus willingly sacrificed himself in our place. Jesus said in John 15, just a few chapters earlier, he said this, Greater love has no one than this, that he or she lays down their life for their friends. And this indeed is what Jesus did for us. Let us remember that. And he suffered for us. And when we think of Jesus' suffering, we typically, if you're like me, think about his physical suffering. The crown of thorns that was placed upon his head. The beatings and the punchings and the rippings of his beard. We think of the whip against his back. We think of the agonizing, excruciating death that he endured on a cross. Now, if that was the only thing he suffered, he deserves the highest praise and honor and um, respect and love for doing that. But that isn't, and those aren't the only ways in which Jesus suffered. John the Apostle, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, recorded in our passage for today other ways in which Jesus suffered. And by some means, these ways pierce deeply the soul in a different way. We'll read this morning as Jesus was denied by a dear, close friend. We'll read as Jesus then is condemned by those who were to protect him and receive him. They were condemned by those. And then we'll also see how Jesus was passed over by the people of Israel. These things, and if you have been in this place as well to a degree, would recognize that they hurt deeply. There is an emotional suffering. There is a relational suffering. There is a deep internal wounding. Jesus endured these things as well. And so we are going to look at what Jesus endured, and we're going to focus in on who he is. Just a reminder, the book of John was written so we would understand who Jesus is. John tells us that indeed he is the Christ, the Son of God, and the good news is that by believing in him, we may have life in his name. So all of the stories that John brings forward and all of the uh, issues that John brings to the surface is to reveal who Christ is. And we can look at this passage uh, dissecting Peter's, you know, denial and what happened. Or we can look at this passage as really focusing on what is truth and those are good things to do. But what I want us to focus in on is to understand the various ways in which Jesus suffered so that you can, again, love him more, that you can appreciate him more fully, see him clearer, and understand that we have a great high priest who empathizes with us in our weakness. You may see some of your story in the suffering of Christ that we see and um, participate in some of his story as we at times may have suffered and endured in these ways. And I hope your appreciation for him continues to grow. He knows suffering. He understands and he has endured the same type of sufferings that at times we suffer. He helps us by walking with us. And here's the good news. will heal all wounds. 
and heartbreaks and scars in the end. So we're going to pick up this story where we left off last week. So if you have a Bible, go ahead, open up to John chapter 18. We're going to return to verse 12, and then we're going to look at three significant ways in which Jesus suffered this morning. So this is John 18, chapter 12, and we're going to move forward with this passage. So then the detachment of soldiers with their commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him. And they brought him first to uh, Ananias, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Now, Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. So when Caiaphas said these things, he was, I believe, unknowingly prophesying what was indeed going to happen. John, guided by the Holy Spirit, wanted us to know this as well, that Jesus was this one man, and that he was not dying from people, he was dying for people. He was not suffering from people, but he was suffering for people. And John then goes on to tell this heartbreaking tale. And he does so by focusing on Peter, and then he focuses on Jesus, and then he goes back to Peter to paint a contrast between these two. Peter will see him denying what is true by denying and abandoning and separating himself from his friend to avoid suffering. While Jesus, in contrast, stands by what is true and embraces the suffering to save his friends. This is our first main point. Jesus is abandoned by his close and dear friend. Let's continue to read John 18, starting with verse 15. Now, Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Now, because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She said to Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold. And the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Now Peter was also standing with them, warming himself. Now meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and also about his teaching. I've spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I didn't say anything in secret. Why are you questioning me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. Now, when Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest? He demanded. Jesus replied, if I had said something wrong, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Anai sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself. So they asked him, you aren't one of the disciples of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants. This was a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off. He was perhaps looking for that fellow who did that. He challenged Peter. 
wait a second, didn't I see you at the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. Have you ever been abandoned by friends? <laughs> we got a testimony in the house, right? <laughs> abandoned by friends who said they would stand by you and defend you. But when the time came, when you were in your trial, <laughs> there were nowhere to be found. This, by the way, is a whole other level of pain. Now, you expect, and Jesus expected, right? And Jesus knew what was going to happen. But you expect to feel pain from those who don't like you or are opposing you or making accusations <laughs> about you. You would expect that. But what is even more painful is that something that you expected that those who love you who are there beside you, who are desiring to defend you, instead of stepping forward to aid in your defense, step backwards into the shadows to save themselves. If you know that pain, you understand how profound that is. And here is Jesus standing trial for doing nothing wrong was being opposed by people who wanted to condemn him. And here was Peter, right? The one who had been with Jesus all along. The one who first recognized that he was the Christ. The one who saw Lazarus raised from the dead. The one who was rowing in the boat and saw Jesus walking to him on the water, the one who was with the disciples and broke the bread and passed it out to so many people. This was Peter who saw Jesus transfigured and saw Moses and Elijah. This was Peter who heard the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. This was Peter who declares, I will never deny you at the hour of his trial. Slipped back into the shadows, wanting to warm himself versus suffer by his association with Christ. That stinks. Even though Jesus did prophesy, said, Peter, <laughs> love your enthusiasm. He didn't say those words, but this is my paraphrase. Love your strength. Peter, but Peter, I want to let you know in your um, bravo, in your pounding of your chest, Peter, that's not going to cut it. <laughs> really, when it comes to the pressing place, you will run, you will deny me. The truth is, it is less painful to take a slap in the face for standing by the truth and in the truth than to have the dawn break on your darkness and weep after the rooster has crowed. Jesus entered into this suffering. If you say that no one can understand being betrayed or denied by your friend, I'm going to tell you someone who can't. His name is Christ. He understands what that is like. And yet, fully knowing, right? Remember that John recorded that? Fully knowing what was going to happen to him. Not just what was going to happen on the cross and before the cross, but fully knowing that there would be a per piercing of his very soul by the hands of some friends who denied him, stepped forward. This is our Christ. This is the love of God. This is the grace of your Savior. And so he endured this suffering 
as well. But this just wasn't now the only suffering as it continues to pile on. Next we see this, that Jesus is condemned by his leaders. And I want you to understand how significant this is. This is John 18, continuing with verse 28. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. Now, by now it was morning. This had been happening all throughout the night. And to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, uh, what charges are you bringing against this man? They replied, well, if he was not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. <laughs> Pilate said, take him yourselves. Judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. Now this took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. So here are the rulers. Here are the leaders. Here are the religious elite, the seminary prepared pastors and professors and ruling party. These were the leaders of the Jewish people, which, by the way, include Jesus. Now, you would hope that this group of people would recognize him for who he was. Right? They should be the ones who were standing on the watchtower looking for the Messiah, knowing all that scripture said and described as this individual. They should have been the ones looking from a distance saying, ha, 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 I see him, there he is, here he is, there he is. Turn to him, follow him, listen to him, give your life to him. This is what we would have hoped that these individuals would have done, but the exact opposite was true. In their positions of authority and trust, they took advantage of the situation, not wanting to lose their power or position, and abused the one who came to save them. This was problematic. Jesus initially came to the Jewish people to declare the word of the, God, the word of the Lord, to be the word incarnate, this word that had been spoken to them from the opening pages of Genesis all the way to the New Testament, with Moses and prophets one after another, and angels declaring the word of the Lord and telling there will be a one who will come. And he arrived. And those who you would think would receive him most clearly and openly and readily condemned him, accused him, forsook him. And it's so ironic to me, if you know anything about Old Testament Jewish law, there was a Passover which celebrated when the people of God, the Hebrews at that time, were in Egypt, and there was blood to be put over the doorposts of their houses so that the angel of death or the angel of God would pass over them. They were to celebrate that, which pointed to a greater Passover and a greater lamb. These Religious leaders trying to be ceremonially clean passed over the lamb that was right next to them. They were so blinded by their religiosity that they couldn't see the very lamb of God who was right there. God help us to see Christ, to look beyond our own religious understandings, to see the reality of who he is. He is the lamb. And these guys pushed him out as they said, well, we are the people of God, but they were more acting like Pharaoh who had had his heart 
part it. They wanted to hang on to things to their own advantage. Is it not true that people in our very day, people in positions of authority, people who are in positions of trust, use their position, use their power to maintain what they want for themselves and to abuse and abandon those that they were given care for. This is wrong. It is heartbreaking. And it is a, it is a pain that cuts very deeply. Jesus endured this pain, not just from a friend who is so close with stepping back, but also by those who stepped forward against him and condemned him that could not see the truth of who he was. Now, John, the writer of this gospel, empowered by the Holy Spirit, then takes us to another, yet another court. Another person who was rendering judgment on Jesus. This Roman governor whose name was Pilate, who was, interestingly enough, trying to find the truth of what was going on. What did Jesus do? Who was this Person. And so ironic, or how ironic is it that the religious leaders were blinded, but someone outside of that community actually wanted to know who Jesus was. God help us, right, to see Christ clearly beyond our own prejudice and help us to understand what Christ endured by being condemned by these very leaders. So now here is Pilate. This is John 18. And this is Jesus in front of him, starting with verse 33. So Pilate, after interacting with these leaders, after hearing, well, he's a criminal because we brought him here. Why don't you just kill him, right? Pilate went back inside, right? And he said, hey, bring Jesus to me, right? So he summoned Jesus and he asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Now Jesus replied, is that your own idea? Or did others talk to you about me? Now Pilate replied, am I a Jew? Your own people, the chief priests, handed you over to me. What is it that you've done? Jesus said, Pilate, my kingdom is of another world. And if it were of this world, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by these Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. (laughs) Ah, Pilate says, you are a king then. Jesus answered, you said that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Retorted. Pilate. Now imagine this. Man of power who was, by the way, quite ruthless. He destroyed without pause anyone and everyone who had opposed him. And now here is this people that he was given responsibility to govern, coming forward forward to him with a criminal. And they thought the charge that Pilate would respond to was that this was a king. And Pilate 
If he says he's a king, he's going to be a threat to you, and he's going to be a threat to Caesar, and he's going to be a threat to the Romans. And so these are the charges that they were trying to bring forward, right? Something that they thought that Pilate would respond to. And so then he, of course, asked Jesus, um, are you a king? And then Jesus is like, hey, do you believe that I'm the king, Pilate? Or are you just saying that because that's what they said about me? <laughs> Pilate, do you see who I am? Do you know who I am? And Jesus telling the truth. When Pilate said, well, you are a king then, he's like, mm, yeah, that's right, bro. If I wanted to, I could kick your can right now. <laughs> it's a paraphrase. Remember that moment in the Garden of Gethsemane where there was a flash of power? And everyone fell back. Remember, this is the commander of the armies of God. Remember that this is the one who could say a word and everything would change. Jesus said, yeah, I'm a king, bro. But you know, my, my kingdom's from another place. And indeed, one day we will see the glories of that kingdom where Jesus returns in a way that displays the full extent of who he is. Where there will be armies. And there will be glories. And he's coming in his strength and in his power. But he knew that what we needed at that time was not the king, but we needed a redeemer. Right? We needed a savior. We need someone that would step forward as we got behind him and took what was due us on himself. Often we reject what we need for what we think that we want. And Jesus always gives us what we truly need. And what we needed was a Savior. The Savior who was also a king. So Jesus said, hey, yeah, I'm a king. If I wanted to, I would have countless defenders but I'm choosing not to. And by the way, I came here to testify to the truth, capital T, truth. Pilate, I want you to know, and people, I want you to know, Jesus was saying, that what he says is true because he is the author, and he is the truth, and he is the measure in which all truths are measured by. Jesus does not take an opinion poll and wonder, well, what do you all think is true? Right. Takes a survey. Well, you know, 57% say, I'm the Messiah, so I'm the Messiah. Right? <laughs> Your opinion does not constitute truth. His word does. And we live in a time in which we all <laughs> gravitate to our own truths. Right. Well, I think this is true. But if you think is it true, does it mean that it actually is true? These are questions that we ask. And Pilate asked the question, you know, what is truth? This question was meant to grab us, and we hear it. That's exactly the right question. But who actually wants to know the answer? He is the truth and testifies to the reality of it. Christ's truth is true. And it's absolute regardless of what we think is true. When Christ speaks, he speaks the very word of God. 
Jesus embodied the truth. So here is Jesus after being betrayed by Judas, being denied by a good friend and enduring that pain, now being put forward by the authorities who should be advocating and defending him, put forward as someone they wanted to kill, and there's pain involved in that. There is a final pain that John records for us in this passage. Not only did these things occur, but Jesus then is passed over by his people. Let's continue to read. This is John chapter 18, starting in the second half of verse 38. Now, after this interchange with Pilate, with this Pilate, he went out again to the Jews who were gathered there. And he told them, hey, listen, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom, this is around Passover, that the custom was that a prisoner would be released. He says, but it's your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me <laughs> to release, quote, the king of the Jews? This was an opportunity for the people themselves right, to step forward and redeem this one who had been condemned by the leaders. This is an opportunity and also shows us the shared guilt of the entire community. Verse 40, they shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now, Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. Now, could you imagine now this compounded measure of additional suffering, right? denied, condemned. And now there's an opportunity for the people themselves, the people in which Jesus healed their diseases, the people in which Jesus delivered from demons, the people in which Jesus raised their dead and fed their stomachs and told them the truth. These people that all saw the goodness of Christ, they too said, eh, Jesus, Barabbas, eh, I want Barabbas. Aren't we prone to want deliverers, redeemers, to save us from our sufferings present day? God, give me a different thing that will get rid of my boss, or get rid of my spouse, or get rid of whatever is ailing you, a cold or an inconvenience or some type of suffering. I want that now. <laughs> Versus, hey, your, your problem isn't external, it's internal. Your real bondage isn't from outside of you, it's from within you. That's the redeemer that you need. How often do we just gravitate towards what makes us feel better versus what makes us whole? Do you hear me? There's a difference. And so now Jesus, as he is descending into glory, denied, condemned, and passed over, as he steps forward as the Passover lamb. This is incredible. So as we close, and we will then transition to communion, I want you to think about 
Christ. I want you to think about Christ in the context of what he taught, what he said about the kingdom, what he said about reality. I want you to think about how he interacted with his disciples, how he interacted with the people, how he interacted with those who opposed him. Consider this man. I want us to think about the various sufferings that we're going to continue as we see even more and even more and even more to the glorious resurrection. How much Christ loves you. Consider this. And if you say, well, 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 no one understands what I'm enduring right now. Again, there is one who understands fully, actually more fully than what you're going through. He suffered it to a greater degree. He is with you. He walks with you. He loves you. And he invites you to follow him. Will you follow him? This suffering Savior who just didn't speak what is true but lived it to a full extent. We should honor him and treasure him more than any external thing. Trusting him in suffering and sorrow that he is with us. You will redeem it. And he is worthy of all of our praise. This is Christ, your Savior. It's good. So I'm going to pray for us. And we're going to transition into communion. I'm going to invite Pastor Key up, if you would come up. And I'm also going to invite the ushers, if they're ready. Um, the ushers can get ready. And they're going to come down, and if you have not received communion, or you don't have the elements, they're going to uh, make them available to you. Just indicate to them that you need some. And they're coming down right now. Thank you, ushers. Sure, appreciate that. Okay? So let's pray, okay? So God, we do thank you for your goodness to us. God, I ask as we pray, Lord, and have prayed for this service, God, that we would have eyes to see who you are, Christ. God, help us in this room to treasure you above all things. Help us in this room to see you and perceive you more clearly and fully. God, we need your spirit to do that. God, I ask that you would indeed heal us as we are on our way to the final healing. <laughs> God, that you would redeem us as we're on our way to the final redemption. That you will be with us until we are physically with you when you come into your glory. God, thank you that you are here with us. Thank you that you are alive in us. Thank you that you promise us new life. We honor you, Jesus. And God, as we now... Renew our faith through communion. Lord, I ask that in our hearts we would do business, God, that we would really consider you, Jesus. Each of us as an individual, answering the question, Jesus, that you asked Peter, who do you say that I am? That we would respond that you are the Christ, the Son of God and believe in you. God, we give you praise for this day and your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, amen.